Imagine we are time travelers in the stars of the great galaxy Andromeda. And imagine our craft can take us two and a half million light years in just two and a half minutes. Already we're heading out of charter territory to the very limits of the galaxy. And there, as we emerge, is one among many of Andromeda's neighboring galaxies beyond. And now we've traveled far enough to look back and see where we've come from, the beautiful spiral formation of Andromeda itself. It's as though we're sailing an ocean, an intergalactic void that stretches 24 million, million, million kilometers. Our destination now, the Milky Way, a large, regular galaxy which we can see only as a misty blur in the night sky. Its shape and structure are similar to Andromeda's. Hot, young stars in the outer regions, whitish old stars towards the center. But we sense that there are exciting things ahead. Our instruments are picking up emissions from the direction of a particular Milky Way star. She looks rather modest, just a million kilometers across, with a surface temperature of 6,000 degrees. She's orbited by a host of cool bodies, and in turn, some of them are orbited by moons. Here in the outer reaches, these planets are large, cold, and inhospitable places. They seem just huge balls of gas, largely made up of hydrogen, methane, and ammonia and beneath their dense clouds there are probably only tiny cores of ice and rock. Some of the planets are surrounded by rings. But onward to the star and we encounter four smaller planets with solid surfaces. Could one of these be the radio source? A close-up of the star itself as she shoots great plumes of hydrogen far into the heavens. But still that radio noise? There's only one possibility left, the blue planet with those wispy white clouds. Surely there must be intelligent life down there. It's so difficult to see. you were bound to guess it sooner or later. That blue planet, with its intriguing radio emissions, is none other than Earth. And that radio signal we picked up as we flew in over southeast England is generated right here, because this is the Greenwich Time Service's PIPs room. Andromedan visitors would probably be amused that Earthlings mark time rather than travel time. But at least the technology required to keep the Greenwich Time signal accurate shows the beginnings of scientific sophistication. Every 15 minutes, four and a half thousand million human beings can check their watches against what Andromedans might think quaint atomic timekeepers like these.
That same technology has enabled man to view his home as a body in space. This is how a battery of satellites have seen our beautiful blue planet. India from an American orbiter. We zoom in on the Himalayas, thrown up when the subcontinent struck Asia, Everest a mere pimp. The Mount St. Helens volcano, dormant. A Japanese volcano, active. A crater in Canada. Patterns in the Sahara. A Chinese salt lake. A bit of Australia. Peking the Andes, the Dead Sea, from the west the Nile Delta, Sinai and the Suez Canal, and Greece, whence sprang so much of man's spirit of inquiry, his urge to seek new worlds. The date, 1975, the mission, Viking to land a robot spacecraft on Mars and search for life. The journey would last a year and a half, taking the long way round by the sun. The hope was to touch down on the Red Planet on the 4th of July, 1976, the 200th anniversary of the United States. But as Vikings slotted into Martian orbit, it became clear that the deadline would be missed. Her cameras revealed no easy landing spot. However, 16 days later, it was decided to take the plunge, and Viking was on her way. Even in the thin Martian atmosphere of carbon dioxide, her heat shield was Viking. And because the air is only 1% as dense as Earth's, Viking had to deploy a giant 18-meter parachute. Retro rockets on, and the lander module hovers gently towards touchdown. And so to work. Viking scanner revealed a cold desert littered with volcanic rocks. The daytime temperature peaked at minus 30 centigrade. At night, it was minus 60. Life, even at microbe level, was nowhere to be detected. These pictures were from a second Viking craft which landed further north. Its site was rockier and colder. Indeed, it photographed this early morning frost of carbon dioxide. Sunset, as with so much else on Mars, is twice as long as on Earth. That goes for the seasons and the year. But Mars is only half the size of Earth and spectacularly marked with gigantic craters and canyons. This is Mariner Valley, the planet's most extraordinary feature. Like the Grand Canyon, only 20 times bigger 3,000 kilometers long, 60 wide, 1,000 meters deep. We focus on a landslip which has sent a wall of rock crashing to the floor of the canyon, here in close-up. Dusty, arid Mars has the biggest volcanoes in the solar system. The clouds over one of the largest, Olympus Mons, can be seen by telescope from Earth. But Mars wasn't always dry. Water once washed and molded these landscapes. This scene was probably nothing but mud. Perhaps it still rained tens of thousands of years ago, and rivers flowed across the plains to form the ancient ruts we see today. So old that small impact craters have since left their marks. 
Some scientists believe that beneath these deserts, water is trapped as ice. One day, they say, if the planet warms up, it could unfreeze and even give rise to life. Meanwhile, the red planet with its white polar caps appears to slumber. The blue ink blot is the shadow of a Martian moon. There are two, Phobos and Deimos, probably captured asteroids. And sadly, theirs is the only movement yet detected over the face of the red planet. To date, life in the solar system is exclusively confined to Earth. This is a model of the Voyager spacecraft currently in the outer reaches of the solar system. Next week, through its television eye, we'll begin our exploration of the giant planets Jupiter, Saturn and beyond. See you then.